So welcome to We The People. Today we're joined by Noah Ahn, president of the Young Democrats Club on campus. Noah, we're two weeks into Donald Trump's presidency. What are your general statements about how things are going so far? Uh, really bad. Um, I think it's pretty scary so far. Uh, we saw that from before he even took the oath of office, you know, during his transition, the appointments or the nominations he's made to uh, cabinet positions showed right off the bat that he wasn't going, he's not going to moderate and become this more presidential version of Donald Trump that he said he would. He's clearly, um, you know, taking a lot of extremist positions. So we've seen that in things like appointing Steve Bannon, who is, or yeah, Steve Bannon uh, to be his uh, chief strategist, the guy who ran a fake news website before he went into politics, um, appointing Jeff Sessions, who is pretty publicly a racist, um, to be the attorney general nominee, uh, among a lot of others. And then since taking office, we've just all these executive orders that are doing terrible things. Um, obviously, most notably on Friday night, the what's basically a Muslim ban he signed. Um, and I think that was kind of the first moment where he actually did one of those things that so many people thought you know, he talked about on the campaign trail, but would never actually happen in the United States. And now it's happening, and he's showing that he can actually be this like terrifying, authoritarian-esque figure. Uh, so I think it's pretty scary so far. And as a liberal, how do you feel about him uh, using all this power he has to make those executive orders? Well, it's pretty hypocritical when you look at some of the statements he and his party have made over the past four or eight years, right? I mean, I saw a tweet from a, a year or two ago from Donald Trump uh, attacking Obama's excessive use of executive orders. And now, two weeks in, he's signing, what, like two or three a day on average, um, which has got to be a, a much kind of faster rate than Obama was going at. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think it's scary for the, um, you know, it's a scary constitutional problem when you have Congress being overridden like this. Uh, and it also just shows the hypocrisy of the Republican Party to attack Obama for eight years for something that they're going to turn around and, and double down on. So you brought up this controversial Muslim ban, and one thing we saw last Friday was a huge protest at SeaTac Airport. Mm -hmm. um, and there's been a lot of consensus from Seattleites that this is unconstitutional, unconstitutional that this is misguided. Um, <clears throat> living in Seattle, which is a very liberal atmosphere. Do you ever feel like we're in a bubble, that you're not getting enough exposure to conservative ideas? Do you ever feel like you need to reach out more um, to other places on campus or in Seattle to get those ideas? Yeah, definitely. Um, I think, yeah, there's absolutely the Seattle bubble um, that you know people in politics talk about a lot, where, you know, like you said, you're only exposed to the super liberal, the super liberal community, right? I mean, in Seattle, we have a city council that's not eight Democrats and a socialist, right? That's definitely not reflective of the rest of the country. Um, I like living in a you know a liberal place like Seattle, but yeah, um, you know, like you said, I think that can kind of skew how people think about the world, um, and you know that was obviously shown in this election where ninety two percent I think of Seattle voted for Donald Trump, but the country kind of sent it a different direction um, to a lot of people's shock here. So yeah, I think it's important for people who have like family or friends in other parts of the country, especially in like rural parts of the country that might have gone for Donald Trump, to have those sort of hard conversations right now about politics and about what's happening in the country, both so that people here can better understand what, you know, what a lot of other people in the country are feeling, but also so those people might get some perspective on us and not just think that we're, you know, crazy liberals. Um, and yeah, myself, I mean, I definitely have some of that. Um, uh, and in the past with the Young Democrats, we've, you know, worked hard to have opportunities for dialogue with the College Republicans, have debates, opportunities for our members to get to know each other, um, to, talk, to kind of help with exactly that problem, right? Um, making sure people understand the other perspective. So, uh, going along with that, the Young Democrats announced on their Facebook page that it was suspending its relationship with the College Republicans indefinitely. Can you explain that decision? Why did that happen? Sure. So, there had been, um, so first of all, with some context, the College Republicans used to be a really moderate, um, kind of Seattle, UW type of Republican club, you know, what you might imagine for this area, for millennials. Um, and. Almost every chapter of the College Republicans around the country refused to endorse Donald Trump in this election and just didn't endorse a presidential candidate. Uh, UW was one of the few chapters that kind of surprisingly chose to jump onto the Trump train and really stayed committed to it despite all of the terrible things he said during the campaign and all the terrible things he's done since then. Uh, and 
they've kind of adopted a lot of Trump's style, the, his you know way of attacking their political opponents, his way of you know harassing marginalized communities, and so there had kind of been growing pressure within the Young Democrats to maybe revisit our relationship with the college Republicans for quite a while, um, and I thought you know because. Uh, of like we were talking about earlier, the importance of, especially in a really divided time like this, having dialogue between people who don't agree. Uh, I worked really hard to try to maintain that relationship. Um, after the Milo event, it was probably more strained than ever really had been before because now because of their, you know, their uh, like celebration of, of endangering people and celebration of triggering people as they like to say, uh, someone got shot and someone was, you know, severely injured. And so, um, after that, tensions were high and, you know, who knows what we would have done ourselves, but then it turns out, uh, as we're working on planning our debate this quarter, uh, they said they no longer want to have relations with us because some of our members privately on their Facebook pages chose to spoke out, to speak out uh, against, you know, the college Republicans actions in hosting Milo on campus. So it was the college Republicans who first said that they. Yeah, so they initially cut off our all of our debate planning and future events. Yeah. But considering how polarized politics are right now, do you think that it's a good idea to be severing this relationship, or do you think you should be trying even harder? I mean, I think uh, ideally the two clubs would be able to get along better, and we'd be able to have you know productive dialogues. Uh, but we've worked really hard to try to preserve that relationship, and at our previous two debates, the dialogue is devolved into somewhere that people are really just talking past each other. Um, at, our, at our last debate, uh, they adopted Trump's tactic, tactic of attacking, attacking our moderator. So, you know, they, they slung insults at her credibility, they questioned her facts, which were pulled straight from Donald Trump's website, and uh, after the debate, some of their members on social media used some derogatory, you know, sex, sexist insults to uh, uh, attack her. So, you know, and there have been so many of those things. That's happened over and over again. So every step of the way, there's been more people saying, maybe we shouldn't do this. Um, and it just reached a point where however much we want to have a relationship with them, they're clearly not willing to maintain that. So it's gotten fairly personal. Yeah, I would say it's gotten personal for a lot of members who have been personally attacked by their members. Yeah. And speaking of dialogue, um, one of the largest criticisms of the liberal community is that dialogue is somewhat censored due to safe spaces. Um, Tommy Lauren is a widely popular uh, conservative TV host and she often criticizes liberals for being, uh, quote, special snowflakes, meaning they're too sensitive and weak when it comes to, um, to dialogue. Uh, what do you have to say to these types of comments? Um, you were saying that one of the um, one of Milo's uh, points is that he thinks that people are triggered too easily. You know, what do you have to say to those types of comments? Well, I mean, I, I'm all for the First Amendment, totally believe in freedom of speech. Um, and, you know, we've said that it, it seems like the administration might not have had the legal means to block Milo from coming to campus, and that's something we understand. But I also think that glorifying the endangerment of students is, you know, something that free speech, you can do it. But just as a human being, I don't get why you would glorify making people feel unsafe. I don't get why you would be excited and proud that you're making people uncomfortable. That just kind of question your ethics as a human at that point. Um, and you know, I think that this, the, the Milo uh, event kind of shows you that while the college Republicans like to say, oh, we're oppressed, we're marginalized, our views aren't tolerated on this campus, in reality, I don't know how that true that is, because we had a lot of Seattle police officers out there protecting their ability to have that event, uh, while in the crowd, a protester was shot went a long time without receiving medical care. And there is someone who, just in the Daily, uh, wrote an op-ed talking about their experiences in the week since the Milo event, uh, being really brutally harassed by like internet trolls who support Donald Trump. Um, you know, they were trying to track down what bus he rides home, they figured out when his classes are to the point that he didn't feel comfortable teaching class anymore. Uh, so, you know, I think that uh, liberals are a lot more willing than a lot of people think to engage in these dialogues and to engage in these conversations, right? Like I said, we worked really hard to keep having our debates with the college Republicans so that our members would be confronted with opposing viewpoints. 
And at the end of the day, they were the ones who weren't willing to keep those sorts of dialogues and exchange of ideas going. So to conclude, and thinking about our whole conversation today, what words do you have for the UW community, regardless of political affiliation, whether they're Democrat, Independent, Republican, what words do you have about the future of, where, of our country and our community? Uh, I think that people should realize that what's happening right now in the United States uh, politically is not normal at all, and that it's a really important time and a really dangerous time. And whether or not you voted for Donald Trump or for Hillary Clinton or for anyone else, whether or not you're a Democrat or Republican, it's so important right now to pay attention and to get a diversity of viewpoints and to really think about what's happening in the world because if something, if, if this administration is going to devolve into something that, you know, is like more of an existential threat to us, it's going to happen because people aren't paying attention and people aren't serving as that democratic check on the government. And so we all need to be engaged uh, and following what's going on and not being distracted by some of Trump's, you know, little brush fires that he'll set off to the side to distract people. Uh, and then vote in midterm elections and presidential elections and local elections this year. Well, Noah, thank you so much, and Good. this is We the People. Thank you.